SnapTech IT CEO Carl Bickmore joins his guest host to discuss a bevy of new notebooks from Dell, Data's coronavirus plan, and the intersection of security and managed services. Plus, we discuss COVID-19's impact on the cloud market with Jason Bystrack from DNH. It's Channel 4 Weekly, Episode 145, The Security Marmoset. Hello, welcome to Channel Pro Weekly, episode 145. My name is Matt Whitlock, technology editor, online director, and host of this awesome podcast for you, the VARs, the integrators, the managed service providers, the IT consultants, the managed security services folks. If you do something with technology and you do it with other businesses, you are likely in the right place. Joining me this week and pretty much every week is executive editor, co-host, and uh, all-around awesome guy, Rich Freeman. Greetings. Greetings, Matt. Greetings, audience. Uh, glad to see you, Rich. Hope things are going well. Things are going well. Things are going well. We're, we're uh, as, as we speak, I am experiencing classic Seattle weather uh, today. A little, a little drizzly outside, but uh, you know what? Nobody's really going outside very much anyway, so what difference does it make? <laughs> I was going to ask you, have you actually left your apartment in the last, you know, month? <laughs> Are you doing okay on supplies? Do you have enough toilet paper? Yeah, yep. Yeah, doing okay on toilet paper. Um, you know, checking out the toilet paper calculator now and again and uh, seeing how good uh, I am into the future there. But yeah, doing doing good there, you know, making the grocery store runs, going for a walk. I do get out. Just well, not as much as I used to. That's good. It's important for your mental health uh, yeah. that, you, that you do that. And I'm sure we've got lots of... Uh, coronavirus related stories to catch up on. But I wanna say first, we are not alone. No, no, no. We have an awesome guest host lined up for, for us today uh, and for you, the wonderful listeners and watchers out there. Uh, please welcome a uh, great all around guy, Carl Bickmore, CEO of Snap Tech IT. Welcome, Carl. Greetings, glad to be here. This should be a lot of fun. Yeah, oh, super excited to have you on. Uh, it's, I know it's gonna be a great show. Um, for those who may not be familiar with you, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your, and your company? Well, I like uh, pina coladas and long walks on the beach. You know, <laughs> uh, I, well, so I, uh, We're going to add this to the show notes, and so in case you have any uh, yeah, interested listeners, they can reach out to you. I, I have a very strict writer, you know, policy. The green room must be perfect. You know, <laughs> I, uh, I'm the CEO of SnapTech IT. We're a managed service provider. Uh, I'm out of our Arizona office. We also have offices in the Atlanta, Georgia, and San Francisco area. And, uh, you know, we've been at this, uh, we started around 2009, and uh, we're just out there, you know, seeing what we can do to build a really cool technology company, one that we like to work at and with customers we like to work with. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a pretty fun ride. Uh, it's uh, definitely interesting times. I'm interested to, to talk about it and see what people are seeing out there. Yeah, and for now for you personally, um, I see mountains and stuff behind you. I, I, are you into like rock climbing or anything like that? <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know I, I don't know I have the physique for that anymore, but I must admit, I, uh, I did actually do a fair amount of rock climbing when I was younger. I used to uh, uh, go to spots all over kind of the western United States, and uh, I grew up uh, in, a, in a cold, snowy spot, and so our favorite thing to do in the wintertime was to see if we could get a trip down into like southern Utah or Nevada or into California to find some rock climbing spots. I, I did used to climb a lot. I, not really been something I've done for many years, though. That's very cool. That's very cool. So what do you do now? What do you do for fun now? Anything, any hobbies, anything like that? Well, I have a couple, you know, um, it's funny things how people get into their profession. And I, I really started as a, a systems engineer or in the, you know, desktop technician, you know, I'll be honest, I started as a person who answered the phone call when somebody bought a HP Pavilion computer at Walmart. And that was experience. All right. <laughs> but if you ever want to know what it's like to handle customer service, tech support, take that job. But uh, um, he, he, I actually went to school for music. And so I play guitar and I sing a little bit. And I actually currently perform in a professional choir. We do recordings and it's kind of a fun thing that I, I do. And I have a little music room in my house and a few guitars hanging up. And every now and then I drive my family crazy. Very, very interesting. So, uh, so how many, uh, I, I want you to pick out maybe one or two quick stories uh, of your experience in customer service uh, for the for the people who bought an HP computer at Walmart, did did any of them tell you that the cup holder was broken? <laughs> no, I actually did have somebody call to ask if there's something wrong with their computer, and I'm like, well, can you look down to see if there's any light showing on it? And like, it's, it's, I can't. It's dark here. The power went out. 
I kid you not. <laughs> and then as soon as they said it, they kind of realized they're like, oh yeah, yeah. Got it. <laughs> but I tell you, the bane of our existence back then was these stupid modems called LT Win modems, which are basically a software-driven modem that worked terribly. And this is uh, circa Windows 95, maybe a little Windows 98 back then when we were, when we were talking. With, it might have been on that cusp. And uh, I mean, you know, first of all, we're phone support, and they can't test it without hanging up. And people would just be in this endless hell loop of trying to make their modem work and call back in. And it was a tough call to get on our side to try to be helpful too. So that was uh, that was the thing. I and mean, we are in a different world today, that's for sure. I remember I remember the soft modems. Oh. They did. They were terrible, weren't they? What and everybody bought them because they were like thirteen ninety nine because they were super cheap. Because the card was basically just a, it was just like the basic interface, but it had none of the none of the stuff on it. They were awful. The bad idea. <laughs> definitely, definitely a bad idea. Give, give me the U.S. Robotics, you know, fifty six K. You know that it's like a rock. I've I've got many of them, and I've talked about some of them here on the show for sure. <laughs> maybe I, maybe I should change my museum pick and go grab a real, honest to goodness quality modem to talk about but we've kind of already talked about them so i'll stick with my original original pick for for later um so carl uh, well it's great to have you here um your your company is a little uh, you said it's very distributed you got three different offices how is the coronavirus impacting the way you're you're doing business right now and and also take a second to kind of say how are the different regulations in all of the different states making it more or less difficult to deal with well that is that is the key for us so you know we have office in california arizona and georgia and there are three states that are taking three different approaches and if i if i had to illustrate it there's the california way and the georgia way and then right in between is probably the arizona way of some form or maybe arizona is a little closer to georgia uh and and so you know our office in california went into the shelter in place uh order much sooner than the other two did. And so we had to work that solution out quicker there than we did in the other locations. Uh, you know, and it's been an interesting time. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a time of great concern. People with their health and their families and, um, you know, wanting to make sure people, okay, of course, all of our, all of our entertainment and normal, uh, you know, community activities are all gone, right? And so everybody's just like in a really strange spot. And so I, I think that the, the thing that we've really made a big effort in doing is making sure that we've stepped up our communication and try to be extra thoughtful. I, like I know, like initially we, we put into place a couple of new modifications to policies right up front around work from home and pandemic uh, dis infectious disease to make sure it was super clear um, that if somebody is feeling ill or somebody that they live with or they've been in contact that they should not come into work you know and, and and making sure that they're taking the right precautions with you know washing their hands with soap which is probably the number one best thing you can do to stop it from moving from one service to another uh and then uh, you know kind of figuring out how to deal with clients and you know the, the nice thing about our industry is a lot of us that are doing what we do already had remote control tools in place and we most of us could probably do just about anything from anywhere so the only thing that's really kind of taken a hit is the project work that involved equipment, right? And we had a good backlog going into this uh, that we had pre-sold. Uh, and we watched that whittle away, but we also watched a fair amount of it just go on hold because we just can't get to it. And there was probably a good solid month there where nobody was signing off on anything new. Um, but I got to say, you know, it's like it... Um, I started to notice a little more traffic on the road about a week and a half ago. And I kind of started to get this opinion that whether the state says it or not, people are just going to start coming out and they're going to just revolt is my opinion. And, you know, and I started seeing articles about this in business uh, peer groups, things that I'm in about businesses just saying, I'm defying the governor's order. I'm just going to open like, you know, shops and uh, things like that. It's an interesting time because I can appreciate their point of view, but I also, want to make sure we're doing the right things and that we're not putting ourselves in any weird liability situation, but also just generally we have responsibility to participate in the community to do our part. And so it's a balancing act that we're all working with. But I got to say in Arizona and Georgia, it's been a little easier 
because the restrictions are lifting quicker and the restrictions were not as strict. And so we're still figuring out the California piece. But what's been great is as we've stepped up the communication with our customers and with our employees and, and regularly checking in and try, trying to address their concerns, we really haven't had anybody be unreasonable or frustrated. It's really actually been more of a bonding experience with us and our customers. I mean, we'll always look back at this five, 10 years from now with that customer and say, remember that time? You know, and so I sort of just feel like that's where that's going, you know? And, and uh, the other thing I say is a good news is like, you know, in the recent weeks, we've seen a pretty significant uptick in activity again, and we're seeing projects starting to close and we're seeing the, the small parts orders pick back up again. And so we're still very cautious about going on site and we're, we're basically taking the stance that we're going to follow whatever our state's guideline is in wherever we're operating. Uh, and to that extent, we will continue to proceed. But we have started resuming on sites under certain circumstances uh, already. And I think that it's only going to pick up from here. You know, that, that's a, a topic that I've really gotten uh, or started to become interested in recently because we, we're definitely entering a period across the country where, you know, more and more often now offices are going to start reopening, people are going to start going back to the office, at least some people some of the time. Uh, and I know it's been a challenge up until this point for a lot of MSPs to kind of figure out if, if I have to send somebody on site, how do I do that in a way that is safe for my employee? Um, and so it's just it's going to be a, an issue for everybody, basically, and probably for an extended period of time until there's a vaccine. Um, so I'm curious what kinds of policies you have adopted. I mean, are you equipping people with, you know, masks and, and other gear? Or I've heard about um, MSPs who have established a policy. If you, you show up at a customer site, you don't feel safe there, you're allowed to leave. How, how have you kind of navigated that? It's tricky stuff. Indeed, tricky stuff. And one of the things I think is particularly interesting about it is um, there is a huge range of how people feel about this and what they should or shouldn't do. And not only with our customers, but within our employees. There are those that want to walk around and pretend that it's completely fake and we shouldn't make, be making any changes as some kind of conspiracy, all the way to those that think the world is ending and you shouldn't, you know, hopefully I have enough beans in my room to live. You know, and so there's kind of two versions, right? It, the, those are, I guess, me trying to illustrate the extremes, and I don't actually think I know that many people on the extreme. But the it's point far, is, it's far more helpful too, Carl, when they are magic beans. Yeah, indeed, uh, the things you can do. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, you know, so what we've kind of decided to take a policy is there's a few standards around social distancing and sanitation, washing, not showing up sick if you're around people that are sick. Um, and uh, we are providing masks and gloves and sanitizer to our staff. Uh, in fact, I even ordered some nice fancy branded ones. So we got some SnapTech ID uh, masks that are going to be here shortly. Um, so, you know, why not take the opportunity, right? Um, but, but then, uh, uh, you know, whether the customers are wearing masks or practicing this is kind of really catch as catch can. So what we decided is we wrote a template email that before every sign, every on-site service, the customer has to respond to it that they agree. Uh, and it, it's things like no drop-ins when they're on-site, they're going to do just that task, no side conversations, and that they'll generally keep the pathways and entryways clear to wherever our person is going to work, and that uh, uh, people will be practicing social distancing and sanitation. And so if the customer you know, commits that they're doing that and they're gonna be able to go forward with that, then, then we go ahead and send them on site. Um, but to be perfectly frank, we have the same exact policy. If someone's uncomfortable, we'll change who we're sending or figure out a different path uh, in any scenario. You know, there's just no reason to push. I like to say, you know, we, we all have our own personal points of view on what we think about it and what is necessary and not necessary. I have to admit that personally, I'm probably a little closer to the, maybe it's being overdone a little bit. Uh, and so, uh, but I want to respect anybody who feels otherwise the best I can. And so that's why we built the policies the way we have. They're a little bit flexible, but they're also ensuring that everybody understands what's about to happen and that expectations are set. Has there been any 
uh, friction, any pushback? And when, when people get the email, do they generally just say, yep, that's good? Or, or has there been some discussion about that? There has not been any discussion. And if anything, we get compliments on people saying, well, thanks for letting us understand and we're glad that you're finding a way to come on site. That's been more of the conversation than, than the friction. Uh, we have had employees that are uncomfortable and we have adjusted and so far been able to meet our demand without that being an issue. And we don't intend on putting any kind of pressure on employees that are uncomfortable. You know, another thing I keep asking um, channel pros about these days. So, so you know, you, you go back to, to March and, and it depends a little bit on where you are in the country, but roughly March is when people suddenly couldn't go to the office and everybody has to work from home. And there's this incredible scramble to, you know, get everybody situated and connected and so on. And we're far enough away from that now that I would think um, some, you know, some best practices have emerged. Like, like now you have a, maybe a better sense for, the right technology stack to, to use to allow a work from home employee to do that in a way that's effective and secure and so on. I'm wondering if you've kind of learned anything along the way in the last two, two and a half months um, that you're, you're trying to standardize on because people are gonna be doing remote work for a, a long time. Well, I think that you might give me a little PTSD there taking me back to that first couple of days there. Uh, our ticket counts are coming in at double and triple the highest ticket count we'd ever seen before. And I feel like in the grand scheme of things, our customers and our system was probably more prepared than some on the ability to remote, uh, you know, remotely work. But the reality of it is, you know, one of the things that is one of our promises that we deliver to our customers is a higher level of security. So we, we, were, we make an effort to be better than the average bear. And, and for some of our customers, it's a matter of their ability to do business because of the compliance requirements that they have. And so for us, you know, what we were going to do was, was pretty well set. I mean, we were going to take a strict approach around that. And so we were working out, even while there's shortages in PCs and laptops, new company equipment and uh, VPN strategies or other forms of security and strategies. And maybe that one customer hadn't quite signed off on the 2FA project yet and said, like, look, you've got to do it now because this is uh, even, even more an issue and it's more exposed. And so for us, it became more work than we could handle for uh, probably two weeks. Um, and then it finally let up. And now we're at a spot where um, it, it went pretty quiet for a while. And now it's kind of more normal. Although, um, well, I say it's more normal and the requests are more normal. We aren't getting very many requests around, I need help getting to remote. Pretty much everybody's got that squared away now. One thing that we have added is, you know, we have a vulnerability management offering. We've been using a tool called CyberCNS, um, and they have uh, a product uh, for scanning remote home networks that allows you to see vulnerabilities. And so it's something that a user can use easily, uh, and it can kind of give you back something that you can read, and you can know if their Wi-Fi is set up with poor encryption. You can know if there's any, like, glaring, scary vulnerabilities running inside their home network. And that's been a pretty good option for us to find a way to get a picture of what's going in without being too invasive or too technical or sending people on site or any of that. And that reality is that's what we all have to be thinking about is how do we extend these networks in a secure way or just know what we're introducing into our clients' environments because it is wildly extending their LAN networks, you know? And if you see a private Minecraft server, do you see that as a scary vulnerability or not? <laughs> It, it depends on the mods they have in place, whether they're good or bad. Would we have a, a you know, a, uh, um, you know, a, a Hunger Games environment, or is this a pretty place where people are building something? You know, <laughs> I see we have a a Minecraft uh, connoisseur with us here, Rich. Well, very cool. Honestly, honestly, it's my uh, seventeen-year-old son is the Minecraft connoisseur, and I've been setting up Minecraft servers for him for ten years. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, uh, I, we, we have stories. I've got uh, uh, an 11 year old and a uh, almost nine year old and Minecraft has become a very important thing here during the crazy stay at home coronavirus times. It, I gotta tell you, you know, my son is like all into the, you know, the, the shoot em up games, the Call of Duties and the Fortnites and the, I don't know, Fortnite I guess is not as cool as it used to be, whatever. Um, and somewhere in the quarantine, he got sick of that and suddenly I found him days on end building a new Minecraft world 
Uh, and so he reverted. It was kind of fun to watch. And I, I felt, you know, as a father, what am I going to do about my kids' usage, right? That's like a real concern right now, right? Because more screen time is sort of inevitable. It's really hard to hold the line for a sustained period of time when people don't have specific things to go and get to like they used to. And so I'm, you know, it's real concerned. But I guess if he's going to play video games, I'd rather be that. I, I view that kind of like the modern, you know, like when I was a kid, I, I, I was given my grandparents Lincoln logs to play with. And then, then Legos were there. And that was the thing. I feel like it's the modern day Legos, you know. So it, it could it be worse. that indeed. And it's very meta that there's actually Lego sets branded yeah. like <laughs> Minecraft because it's like Minecraft is the digital Lego. And then you have physical versions of the digital Lego. Re that'll just blow your mind. Oh, so hopefully nobody tips back and spins a spindle right now. I feel inception happening. You know, you can kick <laughs> that chair, you know. Awesome stuff. Well, uh, it's cool stuff. Thanks for sharing all that. And um, uh, Carl's going to be with us here the whole show. And we got some stories that we're going to talk about. And uh, I'm sure we'll get a little bit more of your insight on these uh, different topics as we move along. So Rich, I'm going to move to the news. Dell has uh, some news this week. They're pretty much our only source of news this week. Although we have some other stories uh, that we're going to talk about here with some other companies and some other topics. But Dell uh, had some press releases and they've updated and expanded the premium XPS laptop family. Tell us about that. Yeah, no, this, this is actually, it, this will be an interesting topic to, to kind of dive into. I mean, so the, there are new products from Dell for us to talk about, but sort of the opportunity in hardware might be an interesting thing to, to chat about because there, there has been some data that came out this week that uh, coincided with these announcements that I think is sort of interesting. But let's just, just look at, uh, at the products themselves just as a starting point. Um, so Dell, you know, if, if the world had not changed radically um, recently, Dell would have been hosting their big uh, annual partner and user conference, I think the week before last maybe. Um, and so they waited a little bit longer um, than they probably would have otherwise, but th they've announced a whole bunch of new uh, and updated products that, you know, we're going to debut at this, uh, this big show. That includes two uh, additions to their XPS product line. So the XPS um, 13 is probably the, the premium laptop that folks are most uh, familiar with, but there has been an XPS 15 for a while. Um, way, way back before this um, particular look and feel uh, for this product uh, came into being, there used to be a, an XPS 17, but it's been nine, 10 years since there's been a 17 inch uh, XPS device. So this week, um, Dell refreshed their existing XPS 15 and they added an XPS 17. Um, both very uh, thin, uh, relatively light devices for um, uh, devices with this much screen space. But, you know, one of the things that defines the XPS family is the, the displays are almost um, bezel-less. There's, there's almost no uh, border around them. And the, the uh, effect that winds up having is that the entire case can actually be a lot smaller when you don't have to accommodate a bezel in addition to a 13 or 15 or 17 inch uh, display and so um, uh, Dell actually went out and, and uh, commissioned some research and uh, they say that uh, their uh, 17 inch I'm looking for this data right now their 17 inch um, uh, laptop is smaller than 48 percent of the 15 inch products on the market and if you've ever seen the XPS 13 it feels more like a 10 or 11 mm -hmm. inch uh, device because of the, the design that they use so um, very compact and um, 15 17 inch devices they've um you know put in latest generation uh intel 10th gen processors um uh, 20 hours of battery life uh on the uh, uh the 17 inch model i think 25 on the 15 inch depend uh, 15 inch depending on what kind of display option you choose uh and so on um so interesting products there so that that's one um piece of the the news that dell announced this week um, this was sort of their consumer PC announcement week. They're going to have commercial products apparently coming next week. The other thing they did was um, introduce a whole bunch of new gaming PCs. Um, and some of those have the, the Dell brand uh, on them. Some of them have the Alienware brand uh, on them because Dell has owns the Alienware um, gaming hardware business. Uh, and um, I guess the, the one to kind of focus in on most maybe um, in the, the gaming area is the Alienware um, Area 51M. Um, so this is the second generation of that product. The first Area 51M came out about a year ago. Um, again, they've sort of upped the specs uh, all around there. Um, and, and this is like a high-end product. It's going to lift the starting price 
is uh, three thousand forty nine dollars ninety nine cents. So I mean, th this is um, something that you know you, you got to be a relatively hardcore gamer uh, to be into this. Um, one thing I'll quickly note about it before we we move on, and I, I wish I could credit the person who brought this to my attention. I was just reading around this morning and came across an article that pointed this out. But when the original Area 51M came out a year ago, one of the things that was really interesting about it was that Dell said, this is going to be an upgradable gaming PC. You're going to be able to open it up and swap out the, the graphics card and the processor. And you know it, it's not going to get obsolete nearly as, as fast as a gaming PC might uh, ordinarily. And um, as, as others has, uh, have observed, you can't actually do that quite the way I think we imagined that would, was, was going to work. In, if you own a first generation Area 51M, you can upgrade the components that were available with the original Area 51M. You can't now start using like the new NVIDIA graphics cards that have been introduced for the second generation Area 51M. So you have to kind of stay within your generation um, if you're going to be doing upgrades. But number of other different products um, in, in different sort of gaming um, categories there that um, uh, Dell and, and Alienware came in with. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the opportunity in both of these areas, but before I do that, I will, I will pause and let both you guys just comment if there's anything about these particular products that stands out to you. So, so many companies have, have tried to make upgradable notebooks, um, especially in the gaming high-end performance one. And of the ones that have actually tried it, Carlo Tessier, usually it's never much of an upgrade and it's always way too expensive. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I feel like I need to go check my, my, uh, my milk jar for my coins to see if this is going to happen. You know, it's a, but no, I, you know, I got a lot of respect for that, uh, that gaming series that they have. It's a pretty good mass produced gaming system. Uh, you know, I, I have to admit at home, I've got a, an older Aura desktop myself uh, that, that I've been using for a little while. Uh, I think it's the R7, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm actually not much of a gamer anymore. You know, I get enough computers at work, all right? Um, but, I, you know, you know, one thing that caught my, caught my ear there, though, is like, you know, I, I, I feel like I have to check this out, a 17-inch laptop that builds and looks smaller than a 14 or 15-inch uh, in practice. That's, that's kind of intriguing, you know, because the first thing I think when I hear 17-inch laptop is like, that's really big to move around with. Um, so, you know, sounds like some magic, but maybe it would be really cool. It'd be kind of worth uh, a little little look-see to get a feel for what that's like. Uh, that, that does intrigue me. Yeah, I agree. I think I think the 17-inch XPS is kind of the showstopper announcement um, in here. And, and it's it's very, very interesting to see how the 17-inch form factor will, will fare when it's not as big as a traditional 17-inch laptop. And that's why that that form that size really kind of faded into obscurity is because it was just so big. So unless you oh, were yeah. doing a gaming thing, oh, it was just like, like, too like much carrying alone. around your dad's briefcase, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It is true. And, and that's, that's actually kind of what the area 51 M looks like is it, it looks like a tank uh, combined with a briefcase. Uh, very, very I, large. I definitely feel like I could launch some type of ordinance from that thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So folks definitely point your, your web browser over to the Dell website and take a look at the, Area 51M, uh, very big. Obviously, that's a performance piece. I will say the 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 other ones that were announced though is the uh, the revised Alienware M15 um, has that kind of look. It looks a lot thinner though and a lot more portable. And I bet it's um, also very very powerful as most of the the uh, Alienware notebooks tend to be. Uh, but yeah, I think the the the, the 17 XPS um, is is kind of a big one uh, that I would certainly consider because uh, I. I don't like to carry around one that's this big, but if I can get a 17 inch screen and a 15 inch size, I'm a pretty happy person. Yeah, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you overall, uh, you know, the, the, uh, I'm excited to see a new generation coming to bear. I gotta say, even though, I, you know, I, I, at least like 10 times in the last month, I've looked at my current laptop and it's supposed to be really great. It's an ultra book. It's like really thin, high process, lots of RAM. I keep feeling like it's slow, you know, and so I feel like I'm ready for the next one. Uh, but, you know, the, the funny thing I was looking at this, I'm like, why is it so slow? And I'm looking at it and things like Chrome on my, my web browser is pulling like eight and 12 gig at a time sometimes when I open up all these tabs. I'm like, oh man, this is out of control. 
I, you know, I have to start thinking my computer needs 64 gig instead of 16 or 32. This is out of control. So I, I'm ready for the next generation. I'm ready for a new generation of processors. You know, my big concern is just making sure that the supply chain is there and making sure that we can get access to these things because that's been probably our number one frustration for at least a, a year now. It's like, can we get what we're looking for? So I'm really hoping Dell's got a plan for that and the other manufacturers as well so that we can we can make sure that this new generation is available. I'm all up for getting them out there. I, I feel like uh, people are going to start to become really unhappy with systems because of what what's going on with the usage, uh, you know, RAM and processor on new stuff is, it's just, it's increasing so fast that you got to keep up. Yeah, well, I'm sure that the, uh, the we're, we're looking at the premium end of the market. Usually supplies are, are pretty readily available for the premium of the premium. I will also point out, Rich, and you didn't, you didn't mention this, but it, it always is an eye catcher to me because um, this is always, so, uh, long story, I'll explain it later, but these new XPS uh, 15 and 17s have 16 by 10 displays. Right, yeah. Uh, and that's new to the XPS 15. They, they, they adjusted uh, that and, uh, and then the, they did it on the 17 as well. Yep. The 16 by nine is gone, 16 by 10 now. I feel like we just had a Nigel moment here. If only they would go to 11. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, well, after this, you go to what, the, what is it? Not, uh, 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 oh, what's, what's that? What's the other common size you're seeing these days? Not five, two, not four, three. What is it? Three, four. It's, uh, not, it's like on the pixel. Yeah. I, three, two, I, I three, two, three, is two. Is there display. a three, two ratio? I mean, I don't know. I that 16 by nine is what I try to have everything in, except now maybe I'm thinking about 16 by 10. And like I said, if, uh, if I was on Spinal Tap, I'd have to have a Dell that goes 16 by 11. Well, so you know, it's funny, actually, my, my, my uh, Dell Inspiron 8600, that was my first high-end notebook that I spent a fortune on uh, back when I was a, a much younger person than I am now, uh, also had a 16 by 10 display. It was a 1920 by 1200 oh, yes, display. Oh, I know. And um, I, and it was right. totally uncommon back then though. Like you never saw that, but I got so used to that ratio. And in fact, the two screens in front of me right now are 16 by 10, because I just find that with, with a desktop OS, with the time you have the bar at the bottom and all that stuff, like 16, nine, this is a little too squished at the top. I like okay. having a little more height. I think that's why three twos catching on too, because for, oh. for, 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 for productivity computing, wider isn't always better. It just depends on what you're doing. Uh, so I, I think my eye in this announcement, Rich. But please, what were you going to say about um, the, what you wanted to talk about? Well, I, you know, it's, and um, Carl was kind of getting at this when he was talking about, hey, I might be ready for an upgrade. I mean, I think there are going to be a lot of people who are ready for an upgrade, you know, especially now that it's starting to settle in that I will be working from home some of the time, even when I don't have to necessarily. I mean, when I first saw um, these announcements, you know, and it's like the, a $3,000 gaming laptop and these other premium products, and I was kind of thinking to myself, is now the right time? You know, so we're, we're in a recession, people are maybe being careful with cash. Is now really the time to be rolling out a bunch of premium products? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through some numbers here. I, I think the answer is yes, actually. And I think there's an opportunity for channel pros in this. I'm just gonna run through some numbers, most of which came out within the last like 72 hours. So Gartner updated their IT spending forecast for 2020 in, in light of the whole COVID-19 situation. And they're now expecting the entire IT market globally to decline 8% um, this year. And specifically within that, they're, what they call the devices category, which is like um, PCs and tablets and, and so on, not uh, data center hardware, but uh, sort of endpoint hardware. They're, they're expecting that market to decline 15.5% this year. And so that's sort of in line with my initial thinking, well, maybe you don't really want to be rolling out premium devices right now. But I also got some research from um, NPD Group. NPD tracks the consumer um, electronics space, and um, they do it on a weekly basis. They just sent some numbers out. So consumer electronics revenue for the week ending May 2nd was up 20% over the same exact week a year earlier. And then the um, TV, tablet, and PC category within consumer electronics, was, uh, um, which ac accounts for roughly half of, of all the consumer electronics sales, that was up 33% um, over the week, uh, same week the previous year. Now, TVs plus PCs, tablets, all in one category, you, you kind of want to break that out. And unfortunately, they didn't give us that um, data, but they did provide, for some reason or other, PC monitor revenues. Those are up 72% for 
for that week year over year, a huge spike. And um, even more enormous spikes, interestingly enough, for PC components. Um, so I, I, and I've been meaning all week to reach out to system builders and see what this has meant for them. But um, motherboard orders up 147% year over year, graphics cards 152%. And then, you know, there are some high-end gaming machines that Dell was uh, introducing there and similar kind of deal there. Um, actually, gaming hardware revenue was trending down in January or February. March comes around, everyone's stuck at home with nothing to do but game. And uh, in March, hardware um, uh, revenue was up 63% year over year, according to NPD Group. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so for the quarter as a whole, they're actually projecting a 2% gain in gaming hardware. It gives you an idea of how bad January and February were. You know, 2% for the quarter, 63% for the month of March. So there, there's actually quite a lot of um, buying going on out there right now. And I suspect this is not a one month kind of trend um, that, you know, that people are going to be looking to upgrade. And, and some of these devices from Dell and from other hardware companies that have stuff coming out right now might actually. Um, be great opportunities for folks who who resell hardware well you know i could chime in on that a little bit i know that you know my experience in my little corner of the world is probably anecdotal in the grand macroeconomics of things but you know for us we had a banner year on pc and hardware sales last year it was driven a lot by you know we were finally rounding up the last of the folks that needed to jettison windows 7 and draw on the line on computers that need to be replaced rather than upgraded and and, and we had our last set of customers to do that. And we were doing a lot of that last year. And so we had a lot of that resale going on. Then January hits and it's pretty much done. And so, you know, we had bigger budgets on our hardware software resale last year than we normally do. And we started off the quarter kind of looking at it saying, this is going to be low. And so it's funny that you say that because January, February, we thought it was going to be low and it was low. So we budgeted for it. So I'd say it's great. We met our budget because we, we, for whatever reason, we were able to kind of see that downtrend happening. I just kept thinking, who am I going to sell these computers to? They've all bought their new computers now, right? So I'm just thinking it's just not going to be as much as it usually is. Um, and then and then that is a definite thing that uptick for us directly at the moment that those shelter-in-place orders happened. We couldn't get them fast enough. And if we ever got a line on 10 laptops, we'd buy them, even if we didn't know who we were going to sell them to. You know, and, and so I think that there's definitely – that piece and but if you take it into the uh business infrastructure stuff we've had significant sales shake loose in april and may and so um look i we're just lucky i think and i think you know i i don't ever want to say that everybody's like this but we we closed april at 151 percent of budget and by may 7th we we're at 300 percent of budget uh, and so I don't even know how IMA is going to end up, but we're we're seeing the sell of hardware going. Uh, we're selling SANs, we're selling servers, we're selling laptops. And it's more than than we expected. And I, my only thing is I sit here and look at it is I just wonder, is this like a couple months flash in the pan and how does this work out over the long term? It, 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 it can't be like this long term. I just can't got to imagine. But projects are shaking loose in the last few weeks and infrastructure projects are happening. I will say this though, they're all seeming to be related to security and compliance needs. Like that seems to be the motivator in the cell. So like, you know, we sold a large project to a client to redo some data center work and to do some firewall work. And a lot of it was because they know they have an audit coming up and they know they have long-term things that they need, need to resolve. And they finally gave us the go ahead. Um, whereas in January, February, March, they had held, April, they had held off. Although we were talking about it back then, if that makes sense. So some of the stuff is, is, is going out and happening. I, may, maybe it's flash in the pan. I don't know. I can't tell. But I'll take it because it's more than I expected after I saw this shift happen, you know. The huge up, up increase in monitors is I, I, I'm kind of laughing a, lot, a little bit because I, I almost guarantee that that is people who were working from home for two weeks and realized it's staring at a 14-inch screen. <laughs> is just not a very productive and conducive yeah. way to work full time. <laughs> so they started, and, and you know my motto, Rich, ye with the most want monitors wins. <laughs> so, uh, and that's for my own heart there, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, uh, and I'm also big on input peripherals too. You know, we talked about this last week, folks. If you're using a, one of those cheap, cheesy, 
built in, uh, God forbid, the, the touchpad for a productivity machine. But if you're using a cheap mouse, get a good mouse. It will be yeah. a life changer in productivity. So yeah, very funny stuff. Um, I don't know if I have anything else to comment on about these particular laptops. They look nice. Um, the XPS 17 is is very interesting to me personally and might might be my future next. But um, uh, it, it, it looks nice. Always good to see a new round of, of uh, laptops. All right, we're going to move on to uh, so a couple stories that we have lined up. And this next headline is, is so Datto. <laughs> <laughs> so Datto's coronavirus plan is to be more Datto every day. Oh. To be themselves is to be is their plan. This seems like an interesting plan. Rich, why don't you tell us about it? Can they be <laughs> anything other than Datto? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's it's actually an interesting question. I mean, th this is one of those times when all sorts of different vendors have to kind of think about what, what do our customers need? What do we need? How are we going to work with our customers? Is that going to be different or not? Um, I think we've spoken on the podcast before. I had an opportunity to interview um, Jason McGee, the CEO of ConnectWise recently, and just kind of get an update from him on, on what ConnectWise is doing to, to deal with uh, this situation and, and help its partners in this situation. Um, I, I will go ahead and, and uh, drop this uh, hint uh, to folks that um, we will have Fred Vicola, the CEO of Kaseya, on the podcast um, two episodes from now, not next, week, next week's episode, but the episode after that. And one of the things I'll ask him about um, during that interview is, you know, what, what are you doing differently? What are you seeing that's different? Um, but I also had an opportunity to interview Tim Weller, the, the CEO of, of Datto, um, uh, not too long ago, and, uh, and, you know, just get a feel from him about that. And yeah, I mean, you know, from his standpoint, it's, it's like MSPs definitely are in a different sort of place right now. They're, they're, um, uh, they have a lot of questions. They, they need a lot of uh, assistance. But Datto's whole strategy, he said, has been around providing uh, a lot of that support and communication and contact and so on. So very early on in my interview with him, you know, he said, really, we're not doing anything all that different. Um, we're just doing more of it. We're, we're going to be more data every day because um, th there is a, a greater appetite for the kind of information that we're typically providing um, all along. Um, some other th interesting things that came up in the conversation, this goes directly to what you were just talking about, um, Carl, because, you know, one of the things I was asking about is how big an impact in one way or another has this whole scene had on you on Datto, and what are you hearing from your MSP partners in terms of the economic impact? And um, you know, he said you could imagine. He didn't know what to expect. Nobody knew what to expect. But you could imagine that for Datto, sales could drop literally to zero. Like the industry could just freeze up, and that has not happened at all. There has been some impact, but actually not nearly as much as he was concerned would be the case. And by and large, that's what he's hearing from the partners as well. Now, it, it, it varies a lot. Um, if, if you were focused in, you know, if, if um, two thirds of your customers are in the restaurant industry, for example, or you have a lot of business in hotels, or there are definitely vertically focused uh, MSPs who have really taken a hard hit. And in different parts of the country, that might be true. But by and large, he's been encouraged by the degree to which MSPs, and remember, data works with MSPs, so we're not kind of talking about VARs who maybe are, have a heavy hardware business and so on. But for MSPs so far, the impact has not actually been as painful as, as he was afraid it might be. Now, as we go on along, as the recession maybe rolls along, you know, he, he's concerned and I've heard other people concerned about this kind of ripple effect where SMBs are not doing as well, not spending as much, and eventually MSPs, you know, start feeling some of that as well. Um, but right now, actually, you know, that this, this corner of the IT world has actually been pretty resilient. You know, I gotta, I gotta say, you know, um, like, like I said, I, I know it's not the case for absolutely everybody, but I think that's generally the feel. And I feel like we're in that category of folks that have been okay. Uh, and, and in, in some ways have thrived. I mean, uh, it's a little weird. I mean, we've added three new managed customers uh, in the last uh, four weeks. Uh, and it's been an interesting thing. Uh, you, you know, I, I guess I never would have thought that I'd add a brand new, you know, managed customer without ever meeting them. That's an unusual, weird thing, right? So, you know, we did some Zoom calls and some this and that's, and um, sure enough, we're signing a long-term agreement, and I was just a little surprised that that's, I, I guess I would have never thought that was something that would even happen. Just 
business is changing, right? That's that's a new norm right there. Um, but I got to say, you know, it's a, it's a kind of an interesting position where I'm at. I'm a, I'm an industry advocate. I speak at conferences, and and uh, I have been a long term customer of Connectwise, Dato, and Kaseya, which uh, you know the trifecta, right? Through various paths, right? Uh, I've been using the Connectwise PSA tool since I started, and we have been using Dato backups. Well, we were customer 300 for them, I think was our customer number uh, since 2009 as well. And, and then Kaseya, we've been a customer of theirs. I mean, really, they've gone on an uh, acquisition rampage as, as the others have, and they bought products that we we're using. And so we buy, I think, four products from Kaseya now. And so I feel like I kind of get a little bit of a viewpoint into all of their worlds. And it's interesting because I feel they have very different leadership between the, the, all three of them, all kind of in their own way of approaching things. Uh, but, you know, I got to say, when it's talking about Dato being more Dato, I do think that there's some really cool things about Dato as a partner that I really like. And one is they have a really cool culture and they do really seem to care about the success of their partners. Uh, you know, uh, we had a customer that was in the travel insurance industry. Uh, they Well, they still are and hopefully will be. I mean, basically, this is like, you know, folks that when you book a trip, they'll say, hey, do you want extra insurance for three days for this or that? It's very ad hoc and very geared around, you know, um, entertainment travel. And, and those, you know, so it's like you can imagine where their business is at right now. And um, they were a relatively new customer for us that we had onboarded um, really at the end of last year. And we went to Dato and I felt like, you know, they really listened to us and really helped us out with that particular customer and making sure they're taken care of, but kind of finding way, creative ways to ease their burden for a little bit as well. And I felt that was a very Dato type response. You know, I felt like good for them. That's not an easy thing when they're already taking a hit, but they really listened and they really helped us and it in turn helped that customer. And if that customer comes out, I feel like they were a little bit a part of helping them be able to rejoin society as a functioning business when, whenever that happens. Uh, and so I, I appreciate that customer. And I know they make, they, they, they helped us be a hero that day. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing, uh, you know, the Kaseya Cares initiatives and I, I'm really close with the ConnectWise folks and Jason and I actually have talked several times and I know he's very concerned and, and looking for ways and, and doing some really interesting things in the market to, to ease the burden a little bit. And so, the reality of it is, is companies like Dato and Kaseya and, and ConnectWise are all trying to simultaneously help their customers. And then at the same time, they're dealing with their own problems and probably needing to cut back some and probably needing to make hard, uncomfortable decisions that they really don't want to be making. And maybe that's an analogy for all of us at some level, right? You know, and so I just appreciate the work they're doing. I'm glad I have the partners that I do. And I'm glad that they, they are out there trying to, to show us a path in a way. Uh, but I, I totally agree that the MSP space does have some resiliency. So for those of you that are in the MSP space, you know, hang on. I think it's going to be all right. And, you know, I think one of the important things I think anybody can recognize is that there is opportunity in an upturn or a downturn. You just have to understand what you're in and make sure your messaging and your approach is appropriate, right? Like the customer that we added just this week they had just downsized from 50 to 35 people. And in that process, their current provider didn't respond well on helping them. It really made them question the entire relationship. And lo and behold, I'm having a conversation with them and they're making the switch. Uh, and you know, once again, same things. They're, they think that we'll provide better security. And also they felt that we listened to their needs and appropriately sized it for their business in this situation. And so I feel like as long as you know and understand where your messaging's at, you actually can grow through this and sell through this storm. Just got to be thinking through that. You know, so those are, and, and, and hopefully Dato, Kaseya, ConnectWise are all doing it as well, you know. The comment you had about the approach is interesting because there's a, there's a quote in here that I wanted to throw at both of you that I found interesting and get your, your take on it. It says, he uh, has, however, cautioned the entire company, including the sales force, to avoid anything that smacks of opportunism. We're not running big discount programs. Well, our notes, we don't feel like this is the time to sell. It, it, at, at, at the one, it, it's hard to, to look at that quote and say, well, we want, we want to take advantage of the opportunities that, the, that this situation provides, but then we don't. So how do, how do, we, how do we factor that? How do we deal with that? I love that question because actually that's a true question whether you're in this situation or you're not. 
In fact, something I love when I talk to my account managers that are doing their small part sales to our customers or when we're out there working with customers, we're never selling. We're never that, you know, this is never our approach. I think more than anything, it's about adjusting your mentality to the customer's needs. And that's why I think it's natural, right? Just recognize the needs have changed. And that's why there's opportunity to grow. Not because you're there to, oh yeah, you're getting screwed by this. Let's uh, figure out some little new hook to get people in. That's not our deal. We're never the hook guys. You know what I mean? We're always about what's practical, what's makes sense and what's for you. Right. And so I, I think that, uh, I wouldn't be out there looking for a scheme. I just recognize the messaging has changed. Now people need to shrink. They need to become more lean and efficient. And you need to show them how technology can do that. There is opportunity in both sides. They, they, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you're taking advantage. It just means that you're paying attention to the need and how it just shifted. And I, I, I think that's you know where uh, Weller was coming from in that quote. Basically, is um, you know that the, the conversation with the MSP needs to begin. What what's how's it going? Where are the pain points? You know, and what can I do to help? And what I can do to help might involve um, you know products and and so on and so forth. But it really needs to feel from the standpoint of the MSP like you didn't call me up because you're checking to see you know, if, if I can sell you some more seats of, of this or that, you, you called me up because you're my partner and, you know, you're, you're looking to see if there's anything I can do to help out. And, it, and it's got to be the exact same story talking to an end user. I, I'm, not, I'm not calling up because I need to make some more revenue. I'm calling up because you're the customer, want to know what's going on there, and I want to see if there's anything that I know how to do that's going to help you with that. Well, and I got to tell you, I have seen some of that, what I would call distasteful leveraging of like, you know, come on free for 90 days, you know, kind of stuff and do this thing. I mean, so some of that's okay and, and it makes sense. It really depends if I'm going to get pressured to make the sell and they're going to take advantage of the fact that I, 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 I decided to take them up on their offer, right? I feel like sometimes when I get the, you know, here's your, your 90 day discount or your 90 day this, that it's really just a way that they're going to find a new customer uh, by just doing a freemium offering. Um, and so, I, it is a tough line, and I definitely don't want to be that guy. And I think that is exactly what he was trying to say, is this isn't a time to, you know, take advantage of people or to, to drive something hard. But to me, it feels very comfortable because I'm really, you know, I think dato has got the right idea. Is you've got to look at your customers and the industry in the long term. And if you take a short gain, uh, advantage of something, you're going to lose them as a customer down the line. It is a partnership. And I look at my customers and my employees and our vendors as partners, right? And so I don't want them to, look, I talked about a conversation I had about a customer. Out of all my customers, that's the only one. Did I just do a blanket across the board? Maybe they would have listened. Maybe I would have taken advantage of the situation. I'm not that guy, you know? And so it's, a, it's about being truly centered on a long-term vision and really considered uh, a person that cares about the actual outcome for the for the them rather than your cell or your own your own thing. It's like it's like everything else. I, I feel like that principle is true this time or not. And it's just now more emphasized. Very interesting. Yeah, cool. Well, we're gonna move on to our next story. And Rich, I, I want to ask you if this if, if like you were there in person when this happened, because I can only imagine the the, the beauty of the scene up on the rooftop of the Empire State Building. Well, you're in Seattle, so you'd be like in the Space Needle. And on one side, there's security. And on the other side, there's managed services. And they kind of were looking off and into the distance and they bumped into each other. And it was love at first sight when managed security or when security and managed services met. Were you there? Wait, am I Tom Hanks or am I Meg Ryan? That just happened here. <laughs> you know what it is it's it's a beautiful picture uh and matt it really is you know and and th this was something that um th this thought was something that occurred to me uh actually probably the last time i saw you in person uh carl at the uh the connectwise it nation event and i was you know wandering around the expo hall there and uh and i remember saying to, to one of the exhibitors at, at one point in, in fact who is in, you know he has a security product that gets sold to MSPs and I said, is there a better place to be 
in the industry right now than at the intersection of security and managed services. Because managed services is just growing like gangbusters. That's what's attracting all this private equity money. Security, growing like gangbusters, and that's a, it's a, a need that isn't going uh, anywhere anytime soon. And if you're doing both those things together, if you're doing managed security, that is a great um, great place uh, to be. That is a, a business that's, that's got legs and, uh, and is gonna generate margins for you. In fact, um, folks, I spoke to about this are, you know, 65% kind of margins are pretty typical. So, so what we're talking about here is a story um, that appeared in the May uh, issue of, uh, of Channel Parra Monthly Magazine about managed security and what it means to be in managed security and to, to have a managed security offering. Um, to, to be clear, when, you know, th there are different ways you will hear people define the term managed security, but we're not talking about a standard kind of managed services bundle that includes antivirus, say, and a firewall. I mean, all that stuff is important and, and should be a part of your, uh, your core bundles. But uh, in, in, in my mind, and in terms of uh, this article and how we position things, a managed security offering is, is really a, um, a multi-layered package uh, of, of subscription price services that are gonna you know, um, uh, perform services, provide services across the whole um, protect, d detect, and respond spectrum of security needs. So th this is more than just the basics. This is getting into something a little bit more sophisticated than that. Um, you know, it, it, quite often, and, and we get into this in the article, that quite often it's gonna involve services that you can't even deliver really on your own. Um, you probably don't have, are never going to have your own security operations center, for example. It costs millions of dollars to build that. But there are plenty of third party outsourced socks that you can build and, or uh, uh, partner with and build into a managed security offering. So we've got a whole article, we, we won't maybe dive too deeply into the details, but you know, a, an article that appeared in, uh, in the May issue that we'll link to from the uh, show page for this episode here that really kind of talks about what is, what do we mean when we say managed security? What's typically included within it? And then the thing that I know a lot of people struggle with a little bit once they become interested in this managed security opportunity is, what, what do I do and what do I outsource? What, wh where am I, what am I delivering on my own and where, where am I partnering with other people to deliver the complete package um, that the customer is going to need? And we, we have thoughts on, uh, on all that stuff in this story. Yeah, you know, Rich, uh, I, uh, I had read that article um, spot on as usual. You can give me my 20 bucks later. Uh, <laughs> <as> a... <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but it was, uh, uh, you know, look, uh, security has been a big concern of ours. I think uh, somehow we were a little lucky to see that maybe a little before some and that we've been pretty solidly focused in that space for probably six, seven years now. Uh, and uh we uh, we went so far as to become SOC 2, Type 2 accredited for many years now. And uh, we really changed our point of view. And, and look, and I'll be honest, you know, a lot of our desire to get to that level was because we had opportunities and that was a requirement for doing business with them. You know, I, I'm not going to say that we we're somehow profits of the industry, but I feel like we paid attention. And I feel like if if a provider is selling IT things today and they're not paying attention by now, boy, you really got your head in the sand. You know, so what can I say? It's uh it's in every deal and every conversation, internally and externally, right? It's not just what we're offering, it's how we live, right? And and I think so so I think your point about it's not about calling firewalls and antivirus security. That's not security. That's a little bit of protection. And in these days, it's pretty ineffective against some of the most common types of attacks that actually occur. It is something you absolutely need. I like the analogy, uh, and this is, uh, for, I credit my buddy Aaron Chernin for, Chernin for this one, but I, it's like the analogy that, you know, your antivirus is like locking your door. Um, but you know what? You got windows, you got a back door to the house, there's a way into the garage, maybe the clicker can be compromised. Uh, and, and, and so, so many people, have no alarm system, they've got no camera system, you know, metaphorically. Uh, and and uh, that means that they're really not hitting the spectrum, like you said. They're really a little bit of protection, probably sort of just okay, uh, and really no detection and no response, right? And so uh, it's a lot to get into, but then again, it isn't. It's just more of a mentality in my point of view. 
and just a confidence in knowing that it's okay to sell it for what it's worth and what it costs. It is a premium service, sure, but I, I, would, I would fundamentally argue that it's basic now. It's table stakes, right? I think you'll struggle to win a deal if you can't tell a good security story. And you'll struggle to keep any customer that you can't deliver a security story to, right? And so you, you can't just start saying, I partnered up with somebody and now I deliver security. But the reality of it is, is just like you, you, you laid out in the article, you know, for us, we're outsourcing significant parts. We have an outsourced SOC, we have a, a SIM tool, we have um, some threat response, we have some policy writing utilities, we have some vulnerability management tools, we have some application whitelisting tools. There's a lot to get into, but you know, the reality of it is if you just get into fundamentals uh, and doing them well, you'll probably be, still be better than the, the grand majority of the stack out people out there. And so you don't have to get crazy. You don't have to dive head first in. It's like any big project, you just start a piece at a time. Identify what you're gonna do this quarter and then identify what you're gonna do next quarter and just keep the charge going. It requires leadership, but if you got it, there's so many offerings now, they're so much better. You know, for those of us that are trying to do this five years ago, putting a SIM out to a 20 person law firm was untenable. It, you know, not to crack a tenable joke, I guess, a Nessus tenable joke, uh, but the, uh, but the, oh, I said, I like that. That was a really nerdy laugh that you gave me there, Rich, because you got that joke. Right? Oh, I got it. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> uh, totally unintended pun right there. Oh yeah, so that's a solid stuff right there. I, I feel like I'd get my propeller hat on right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, the, the point is, is that the offerings are now pretty doable in the SMB space. It, you just have to learn how the world has changed and what you need to do. And just if you don't know what to do, just go learn from somebody else. There's a million peer groups, online resources, podcasts like this that you can just go and start listening to, you know. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the key thing, I, I, um, uh, everything you said, you know, it's just absolutely right on in terms of security. But, but what's really critical about the managed security piece of this is that you're delivering all that protection and, and service and support that the customer needs as a service. And, you know, it's, it's, it's paid for out of the operating budget. So that, that's the piece of that love story, the managed services security love story that's so key. This is how, you know, a lot of uh, businesses want to consume IT right now. And so your ability not only to keep these people safe, but to do it in a way that kind of aligns with, with the way that they want to be paying for IT uh, is also part of that, that opportunity. I mean, that's just the reality of the world in general, right? And why do I need to pay for more than I want? And why can't you be flexible as my business changes? These are, these are expectations now, table stakes, right? If you ha haven't got your offering moving in that way, you're getting into the laggard territory of the market and you might be able to maintain some long-term customers, but you'll really, really struggle to grow. Rich, earlier you said protect, detect, and respond in a very, uh, very interesting way. Have you, have you chosen a mascot for that phrase yet? Uh, I, was, I was picturing like Smokey the Bear while you were talking about it. Like you need to market that. Uh -huh. Oh, well, I, first of all, I didn't make that up. So that, that's, you know, like if you look at the NIST framework and so on, that's, that's how they divvy things up. But I, I think that's a genius idea, Matt. We do need a, a Smokey the Bear for... Uh... Yeah, what animal would we use for that, though? Would it be like... Uh, we need, it can't be like an animal like, uh, like a bear, because that's been done. I think maybe like a marmoset. The protect, <laughs> detect, and respond marmoset. What do you think? I, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Plus, nobody knows what the hell a marmoset even looks like. So that way, when they see it, they'll be like, what the hell is that? <laughs> Carl, what do, you, what do you think? What animal uh, would you think? You know, it's hard to say. I'm still kind of dwelling on the only you can prevent ransomware or only you can detect. I don't know. There's some good things. I, I don't, I'm not sure what the right thing is. Maybe, maybe something like a little lizard. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but then the guy, yeah, Geico will see if you use a lizard just because that's oh, right, like, right, owned right, that market right. now. Same you know, when you were talking about more on your cybersecurity, it doesn't <laughs> ring a bell. It doesn't quite <laughs> yeah. hit. You know, when you were talking about security um, earlier and how, uh, you know, antivirus and stuff isn't necessarily security because it's not the kind of attacks we get. The problem, and I like the, the analogy you had with the house, but one thing that's always really important to stress with customers too is you have all the physical security in the world on your house. Right. But if you let the guy who's dressed like the fake cable installer come into your home, none of that physical security stuff does any good. So it's yeah. always about training employees because the human beings now are the weakest link in the security story. 
Yeah, well, you you know, I sort of feel like it's a, you know, it's a multi-leg stool and you just chop any of them off and you start to get pretty unstable, right? And and people forget about the human element. And it is actually one of the hardest ones to fix because you can't just go buy it, right? You can't just say, Mr. You know, managed server security practice provider, please implement human education. You know, you can provide it, but it's really it's a cultural thing. Once again, comes back to leadership. And you know, some of your customers, they're not going to have that leadership in place. So you got to find ways to help them grow. But you know, the end user awareness training piece and finding ways to help them and make it easy for them. The reality of it is it's like the, it's like the it's like water always finds the least path of resistance right uh and so it's human nature so help make security the least path path of resistance for them and it's not naturally easy because it almost always involves some additional check i mean i I hear my back office people are like how many of these dual factor codes do i need to have for what you know the reality is if you get them in the right mindset then they start to embrace it but it's it's one of those things where people naturally don't want to do it you know it's a very true. Challenge. And that's and that's why we need more campaigns with our with our protect detect and respond marmoset. Or, <laughs> or, or, or the ostrich, like you don't keep your head buried in the sand. Although I think that one's been done before. You that, know? Yeah, that's that's a little classic, you know. Yeah, little, I still little, I still like the HP uh Super Bowl commercial with the herding cats. You know, there might be something there, you know. Yeah, cats everybody always loves cats i we're gonna work on this plan and rich we're gonna go we're gonna go with a with a psa style uh announcement with some cute mascot to, yeah the train and people. A, a poster and the, the whole thing yeah i i think i think this is good there might i think be a sloth somewhere in this yeah. <laughs> you're too slow to respond that's right so you're the <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's just awesome I, just awesome. I don't believe in security. I'm the technology sloth. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right. With a, on that note, on that note, we're gonna we're gonna grab our sloths and marmosets and take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, uh, we are going to have a great interview uh, with Jason Bystrack from uh, DNH. We're going to talk with him about uh, the impact on the cloud market and a whole bunch of other things. So you'll definitely don't want to miss that. Stick around. We'll be right back. All right, we are back with part two here of Channel 4 Weekly. We've got a great guest interview lined up for you today. Uh, coronavirus is weeks, weeks, weeks later, still in the news, still not going away. And we're still trying to figure out the aftermath of how it's going to affect, well, everything. So uh, here to talk a little bit about that, particularly the impact on uh, the cloud from the coronavirus and market strategies and how to bundle cloud solutions. Lots to talk about. Welcome, Jason Bystract, Vice President uh, of the Cloud Business Unit from DNH. Welcome. Hey, good to be here, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, great to have you on. So I, I, would, I would assume most people uh, who would be watching the show are familiar with DNH. Um, but why, don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and uh, your, your unit there and what you do? Sounds good. Well, I've been with DNH for a little over almost a year and a half now, actually, and I came on board to you know, build out uh, deeper investments into our cloud business unit that we form. But DNH has been around for over 100 years, 102 to be exact. And what we're known for is a high touch partner engagement model for those that service the SMB market. Now that's gonna change going forward. You can't actually touch people anymore. This is true, not with the coronavirus, right? <laughs> so it's gonna be a high virtual touch perhaps, or? Exactly, we're, we're transitioning <laughs> like everybody. <laughs> Fantastic, so um, the discussion here is gonna be kind of around uh, cloud market strategies and um, how the coronavirus is impacting that. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your, about your thoughts there? Yeah, absolutely. So it's certainly been uh, a busy couple months and, you know, I think we're, we're watching people make all the transitions into, you know, what some, I guess, would call the new normal. But, you know, as people are shifting to a work from home model, cloud services has certainly become a key component of the technology solution to help enable that. So video and collaboration solutions, we're seeing great uptick with, uh, things like Microsoft Teams, Cisco WebEx, Ring Central, Dropbox, uh, they've been fairly explosive for us as far as the amount of growth. And we're also seeing public cloud infrastructure such as Microsoft Azure, uh, making it a lot easier to kind of scale remote access solutions. I would say from a partner standpoint, you know, those that are MSPs, 
Uh, they tend to have the skills, I would say, that you know, they, they have um, remote service delivery skills that serve them well in this environment. The fact that they have contracted recurring revenue that kind of dictates payment terms and cash flow uh, puts them in, I think, a good position to weather the financial storm that's going on. And you know, overall, they tend to be a bit more familiar with some of these common cloud solutions. So they've been, uh, I think, doing a great job uh, helping you know, people move into a remote workforce environment. Um, I, we are seeing a few challenges with the MSP model. You know, some of those are, are things like managing a home network versus maybe more of a, a, a corporate business network that they're used to, even adjusting SLAs to meet uh, work schedules, you know, that might be changing for some of their clients that they support. But, but overall, they seem to be adjusting. I'm curious, Jason, what, what kinds of um, use cases are you seeing specifically for the, the public cloud stuff you talked about, like Azure? Yeah, great question, Rich. So, you know, certainly Windows Virtual Desktop uh, is one solution that is picking up a bit. Uh, people are using Azure even for things like, uh, you know, VPN type solutions and even distributing some of the workloads. Instead of having to go back and hit the corporate data centers, they're doing that and hitting the Azure data centers. So those are some of the most common use cases, I would say. And what kind of uh, uptake are you seeing on Windows Virtual Desktop? I mean, that's one of those technologies that you would think is a perfect fit for work from home. I'm curious if you've seen a real spike in that. Yeah, I mean, it's coming from a small place, as you know, Rich, because it's still you know fairly new and Microsoft's made a lot of changes uh, lately with the way they're delivering that. Uh, DNH has partnered, uh, in addition with Azure, with, uh, with Nerdio, which is a great MSP platform to make it easier to build and deploy uh, WVD solution. So that's really helping us drive a lot of that uptick. You know, we, we've heard even just in, in the business media, there's been a lot of talk about, uh, you know, Teams and Zoom and, and Microsoft recently announced they, as of like two weeks ago, they had 75 million daily active users on Teams. Um, I'm wondering if there are any solutions that you're seeing um, increased demand for that maybe surprised you a little bit that, you know, it, the, the use case wasn't quite as obvious as video conferencing, for example. Yeah, I think maybe an example I'd say with that would be what we're seeing with Dropbox uh, is, is one, right? So when you think about, you know, how you normally access files on, a say, a network drive, you often have to be connected through VPN if you're remote. So it makes it a little bit more cumbersome. What's nice about Dropbox, it's, uh, it's VPN free. So a lot easier to, to log in and you can use it on so many different devices that we've seen that pick up uh, quite a bit. And another solution that a lot of MSPs are also familiar with that has some uh, similar capabilities is from Axiant and their Anchor product. Uh, again, it's a, it's a file sync and share type of solution that makes it very easy to you know, work in this type of remote environment. And then as, as uh, those kinds of solutions, as Teams, Zoom, for example, as uh, sales of those increase, are you seeing sort of um, associated or, or follow on uh, increases in, you know, backup and security and the stuff that would typically accompany some of those licenses? No question. I mean, the overall cloud business is up and a lot of the, the, the savvy MSPs, let's say, are making sure that they're including, you know, those types of, uh, you know, maybe not so exciting, but very critical solutions like backup and endpoint security. And, you know, at d and I know our team has spent a lot of time helping to make sure that you know, MSPs are offering that attach and, and that additional capability. Are, are you folks at DNH doing anything differently, doing more of, of anything to accommodate the increased cloud demand that you're seeing right now? Have you added resources, rolled out programs, anything of that nature? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, we have. I mean, first of all, we made a very quick and easy switch to a remote workforce um, uh, environment ourselves at DNH, and ironically, we just went through a move to our new corporate headquarters uh, late last fall. So uh, we just happened to have done a lot of that type of work, and just ironically, we're well prepared for that. But you know, as this uh, uh, you know crisis has kind of unfolded a bit, you know, we've worked especially on some financing solutions, for example. So uh, one of the ones that I work a lot with is our devices a service solution, and we put together working with our finance company. Uh, a program that defers payment for 90 days. So it gives partners a chance to deploy a solution in a very you know, easy to consume as a service monthly payment model. And then on top of that, you get to defer the payment for a while. Uh, we've also uh, worked on a lot more campaigns. We've put together a remote workforce campaign uh, to help uh, educate our partners uh, about some of these solutions so they can go out and help solve those business problems that 
so many people are facing right now. So, you know, it's, uh, it's exciting to see that we're able to contribute and, and, and help partners uh, be successful in that way. So, you know, there have been a lot of uh, people talking about the, uh, the work from home, the remote work kind of scenario. That, that was an urgent and immediate need that arose in, in March. Um, it's an ongoing need now. And I mean, I, I just saw there was some uh, data from Citrix yesterday. They went out and polled 2,000 workers in the U.S., 64% of whom said it's going to be at least a month before they feel comfortable going into an office, just from a personal safety standpoint. So remote work is not going away soon, but th there have been a lot of predictions that it's just going to be part of the business landscape permanently going forward. I mean, how do you think this coronavirus experience has maybe permanently changed the cloud market? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing, I think, some of the same things you are, Rich. You know, um, you know, I've recently read a lot of articles how it's accelerating the digital transformation that so many of us have been talking about for a long time. So, you know, that's kind of exciting. You know, certainly not in this type of environment did you want to see it materialize, but it's happening. Uh, more and more analysts and company executives are highlighting the fact that remote and home-based workers are they're productive and most expect these workers to maintain some level of work from home, uh, even permanently, we're hearing, right? Uh, I think it was this week we just heard that Twitter said that anybody that wants to work from home permanently can. So there's more and more of those headlines coming out. Uh, I think that technology has played a key role in making this possible. And a lot of the cloud savvy channel partners and MSPs, they should continue to thrive. Uh, DNH has done a lot of work around training and enablement to help partners transition to this model and even fill in some of the skill gaps, uh, you know, maybe that they have as they are, uh, you know, advising and supporting their clients through this. And I mean, is that, uh, does it feel like that message is getting out, um, you know, that much uh, more loudly recently? Are you seeing um, increased demand from your partners for uh, advice, guidance on building a, a cloud business? No question. I mean, we're seeing it, you know, our partners coming to us for that type of help. And in addition to the proactive work we're doing to reach out to them because their clients are calling them and asking about it, right? So, um, I think one of the challenges too they have is there's a bit of confusion like you're hearing about so much different free software and you know all these things you could just download and use and you know quite honestly that creates uh, you know security questions um, you know creates uh, support questions and how, how you deal with that so the more that the channel partners and MSPs are out there proactively dealing with this instead of having their clients figure it on their own I think the better and more secure of the types of solutions are going to be able to deliver for them. Now, in, in the um, uh, almost year and a half uh, that you've, you've been at DNH, I, I know you've been giving uh, presentations. I've had a chance to see it at least once that I can remember off the top of my head, but you've been speaking a lot about best practices that um, you folks have observed at DNH for um, building a, a cloud practice, uh, which is something that we've been talking about a lot at, uh, at Channel Pro this year, the difference between just reselling a cloud product and building a cloud solution. So, I mean, this is a big topic. You, you've got a lot of different thoughts about it, but I mean, if you were to maybe outline some broad principles for things that partners can do, need to do, to really kind of maximize the margin that they're making in, in the cloud, what, what are maybe some things you'd point to? Yeah, absolutely, Rich. Um, you know, the, the transformation to cloud that everyone talks about, it, it seems like it never fully happens, right? There's always another group of partners that are looking to do that. Uh, what we have at DNH is we have a program called Success Path to Cloud that we've developed to help with that the transformation journey. And the way we've outlined it, we call it, uh, it's based on our eight steps to cloud, you know, process. And, you know, high level, you know, the eight steps are number one is build your cloud solution. Uh, number two is choose the vendor partners that you want to plug into that solution. Uh, third step is develop a pricing model for that solution. Uh, the fourth is putting together your key performance indicators in your business plan of how you're going to go and drive that into the market. Uh, the fifth step is, is doing the financial planning and analysis to make sure it's profitable and you're comfortable with the, the business plan. The sixth step is outlining the operational process because at the end of the day, you've got to pull it all together and make sure you can run it and invoice it, things like that. The seventh step is a marketing strategy to start to get the word out. And last but not least is enabling your sales team. You know, one of the, I think, challenges we find is a lot of partners maybe start with a sales team, like a customer asks to buy something and suddenly they're trying to develop a solution on the fly. You know, we really advise, you know, people to go through these steps a bit more, uh, you know, methodically because that's going to, you know, help them make sure that they have a profitable solution that provides a good customer experience that, 
know, that they can, um, you know, take to market. Uh, we also think it's really important to prepackage these as much as possible, uh, which sounds counterintuitive because we all, I think, grew up in this industry saying we're solution providers. We listen and then we come up with a solution. I think with cloud, you, you have to kind of pre-develop some of these ahead, kind of maybe a good, better, best option, you know, for some bundles. And, and you can always customize that a bit afterwards. But if you start bringing in too many, you know, variables of like the different vendors and things like that, it can really make it challenging to provide a good customer experience, uh, good support experience, and, and, you know, frankly, make it profitable as well. So, you know, those are some of the best practices that we, we work to guide partners through. And, and maybe just to make this tangible for folks uh, in the audience, when we're talking about cloud solutions, I mean, that it doesn't necessarily have to be all that complicated. I mean, what, what's a, an example of a garden variety cloud solution that somebody could potentially offer? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, uh, cloud is, is typically, you know, it, it's, it's you're using somebody else's data center to access software or infrastructure instead of your own, right? If you want to really simplify it. Uh, I think the most common way to start is, you know, with kind of a, we call it an anchor solution, such as Microsoft Office 365 is one that is pretty, you know, heavily used across the industry, right? But to build a solution, what we do, uh, DNH has put together what we call cloud clusters, where we took that base package like Office 365, and we identified other components of that. So when we look at, um, you know, a, a collaboration component, we start talking about, well, would you like to use Teams or how about Dropbox? We look at a voice component and we plug Ring Central in. We look at an endpoint security and you look at products like WebRoot or ESET or Cisco Umbrella. Um, so what we do is we, we really work to you know, make sure that the vendors we onboard plug into and integrate with the base package of Office 365. And, and that, you know, it's got to work technically and that becomes a foundation to building out different solution bundles and options for customers. I'm curious, Carl, if, if any of this kind of resonates with you in, in terms of how you're approaching cloud at, at your company right now. Uh, do you have bundles or cloud solutions of, uh, of these kinds uh, on, at your company? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Rich. Uh, yeah, I think that he's been hitting it right on the head on uh, some of the planning and the approach. Uh, for us, Office 365 uh, backup and then file sharing systems are those anchor products that make it really easy to adopt a cloud-based solution. And really, frankly, it's the way pretty much everybody should be operating. There aren't strong reasons or cases for doing it differently today. And so for those that are laggards in the industry and haven't adopted some of these solutions, it's a good time to be introducing that. And to, you know, it's a, it's a classic case of, of a choice problem. If you give somebody 24 choices, they'll have a hard time making a decision. You give them three choices, it's much easier to make a decision. So it's just keeping it simple and helping them understand it's comprehensive for their need. And so that's where the bundling piece makes sense. Uh, you still wanna make sure the solution is appropriate for the customer and that you're doing it correctly, but uh, you know, bundle in a way that makes it easy for them to understand what they're getting. You know? And it, it's pretty effective, yeah. Uh, one of the things I know that um, you talk about sometimes at DNH, uh, Jason, is bundling services into these cloud solutions. And that in fact can be one of the more profitable pieces of this great source of recurring revenue. So what kind of role do, does managed services potentially play in a good uh, cloud solution? No, it's a, it's a great point, Rich. I mean, let's be honest, nobody wants to pay extra money for a service, right? You know, you, you never get look forward to that. So when you can bundle them into the product that they're, they're gonna purchase uh, and, and offer a blended solution, it really helps. Some of the most common ones, certainly when it comes to cloud, are you know certainly assessments, especially for complex solutions like Azure, where you need to understand what workloads you're going to put in there. Uh, there's migration opportunities. I mean, even a, a simpler product like Office 365, you still have to go and migrate often and set up that service. So that's another one. And then as far as managed services, um, it makes it easy to put things into maybe a per seat or per user model where you can offer um, you know, remote desktop support, remote infrastructure support, and certainly uh, phone or help desk support you know, to go along with those. So you know, we really try to work and encourage our MSP partners, which I think are well positioned for cloud, to, to offer those things in and bundle it along with the, uh, the typical cloud products. One of the, uh, the steps that you ran through there before was pricing. 
um, which I know is a, a perennial challenge um, for channel pros. I mean, you know, in and, and beyond the, the cloud, and especially when managed services are involved. So, I mean, any, any tips, any advice in terms of how to think about pricing a cloud solution? Uh, yeah, what the, it, within that module, Success Path to Cloud, we talk a lot about what we, we call value-based pricing. Um, so often folks that maybe started their business in a VAR model, if you will, like a more of a resale model, they look at a, their cost basis and they go, well, 20 points sounds like a great margin. I'm just going to add 20%. Uh, we would argue not to do that. Like, um, I'll give you a, an example is that like a cloud migration, the typical market price we see is about a hundred dollars a mailbox to migrate from, you know, say their current email solution into say office 365 you know, in order to, your cost to do that might only be, you know, maybe you spend 20 or $30 for Skykick or BitTitan for a tool to do it. And then you got some labor costs, maybe bring you up to 50. If you added 20% to that, you know, what's that 60 bucks? You're, you're shortchanging what you could have sold that for. Uh, and again, you do this within the bundle. You don't do it as a standalone solution. Nobody wants to pay a hundred bucks for a migration, but as you're offering your solution, factor that stuff in at the component level and then put it all together into a bundle. So, you know, we're, we're big proponents of value-based pricing to preserve margin for our partners. If I could chime in, if I could yeah. chime in on that one, I mean, here, here's the thing. I think the classic saying is something to the nature of, you know, you're not paying me for the half hour I did this. You're paying me for the 10 hours of experience and education I received to get it done within the half hour, right? And I think if anybody's really chasing down a service-based industry like managed services, in conjunction with uh, cloud opportunities and resale opportunities, you're missing the mark if you're doing a transactional type type sale. You can't be chasing the commodity and working off of that low margin. You'll you'll never make uh, what you should as an IT company or an IT person. It just the math doesn't work. But it, it, it's really important that you follow a value-based sales model rather than the transactional or commodity-based. You know, the, the first moment when you hit somebody with a price and they say, oh, you know, so-and-so can give it to me for half that, then you're, you're right in the conversation where you want to be because now you get to explain the value and why they shouldn't do that. Almost everybody understands that there's somebody willing to undercut. You just have to be able to show them the value so that they know the difference. And that's why you, it's worth 100 versus 60 as an example. Yeah, Jason, your thoughts on that? I think Carl's dead on, right? So, uh, and, and I think that also reinforces why the bundling ahead of time is so important so that you're not having commodity discussions, you're having experience discussions and services discussions like that. I just, one other thing, I just feel like a lot of times uh, when it comes to the sell process, I see um, providers and resellers, service organizations make the mistake of looking at the hardware or the, the reset, the cloud resell on its own and the service on its own. The reality of it is, is our best margin should be in our service. And so if you're not marrying the two and ensuring that both are happening, you're, you're really putting yourself at disadvantage. It's probably not worth the deal if you're not in making sure service is happening at the same time. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think that's going to that's gonna, uh, do it for us. We're pretty much out of time. Um, Jason, I want to thank you so much uh, for being on with us today and talking to us about, uh, about this. For people who want to uh, know a little bit more about you, where can they go to find you or contact you? Uh, my email address is jbystrak, J-B-Y-S-T-R-A-K, at dandh.com. Uh, also on Twitter or LinkedIn, and uh, would look forward to working with any partners looking to advance your cloud practice. And thanks for having me today. It's great, insightful stuff, and uh, we will definitely hope to have you back. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to hit our end of the show features. We got a, a Tech Bank Museum pick for you, and Rich will tell us what has been and what will be, and maybe more. You never know. Stick around. We'll be right back. And we are back with part three, Channel Four Weekly, where we wrap up the show with our uh, end of the show kind of regular features. We'll get into those in a second. But first, we have an awesome guest host, Carl Bickmore is here with us still. And uh, we are going to play five questions with Carl. And what that is, is uh, Rich and I off the top of our heads, it's very important. We'll come up with not one, not two, not three, not four, but five questions to ask Carl. He has no idea what they're gonna be. And actually Rich and I have no idea what they're going to be. <laughs> so uh, it, this will certainly be interesting. Here we go. Rich, take question one. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm always big on the food questions. Uh, so I, I, I know this would be a legit question to ask 
somebody in New Mexico. I, I'm pretty sure it's it's a, an Arizona question too. Green sauce, red sauce, or Christmas tree? No, no doubt green sauce, and hopefully with some hatch chili, which is a New Mexico chili. Okay, I'm a Christmas tree guy myself. I, I can't choose, so I want them both. You can get on board, but some of those red sauces just don't cut it. All right, good. Question number two. If you were confronted by a life-size marmoset in the woods, what would you do? Uh, I would appropriate it for an excellent ad campaign to do, bring about security awareness to the greater population. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rich, take question number three. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, let's see. So one one of the things uh, I, I I have only ever had an opportunity to uh, to do this once, but one, one year I uh, I flew down to uh, to Phoenix from Seattle and uh, in in March when the weather here is crappy, and I took in some Cactus League baseball. It was wonderful, uh, you know the preseason stuff. So do you have a a Cactus League team that uh, that you like? Oh man, I'm gonna fail you miserably on this one. Baseball, you know, I can see in the background there, you've got a Yankees. I think that's a Yankees hat. You know, yeah. I'm only vaguely familiar enough to call it that. So <laughs> good for you, Rich. I mean, I guess it's not a Mariners hat, so whatever. But, <laughs> but you know, honestly, uh, I am terrible. I have yet to attend a Cactus League gay, gay man here, and it is here every spring. And, and people love it. Come from all out of town. So I'm a no-go on that one. Diamondbacks, but I don't even think they're here. I think they're like in Florida or somewhere else, you know. I don't think they play their spring games here. Oh, yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm terrible. I got I got <laughs> nothing for you. Start talking NBA with me though, and then I'm on your I'm on your file. Oh, okay. I can, I can, I can so an NBA that. guy. Well, maybe Rich can formulate an NBA question for you. So, I got I got one. Uh question 4. What would you say is has been your guilty coronavirus quarantine pleasure? Like what have you been doing? that maybe you wouldn't normally do or, or whatever during this time period, or, you, or you've done too much of, I should say. Yeah, what haven't I done too much of? <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, oh man, uh, so I, I can say my wife and I have started way more series on the old streaming services than we probably normally would have. And we've also jettisoned way more, like, yeah, that wasn't very good. No wonder we didn't watch it before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, we're probably doing a little more of that. But, you know, it's kind of a serious question. Serious though, it's like, I I'm getting out on walks with my little doggy more and my wife, and it's really nice. And I don't want to call that a guilty. I'm not guilty about, about it at all. It's great. But that's been my favorite thing about it is I really am getting out and doing that more. So that's been really nice. Very cool. Quick little uh, 4A, uh, name a couple uh, series that you started, maybe two that you liked and two that you didn't. Oh, okay. Well, so, you know, this is where you're going to get into some really eclectic, weird tastes uh, of mine, I suppose. But like, Even better. I, you know, I, I, I super love that show, The OA, and I wish they would do more seasons than two. They, and I don't think they're going to. That is the weirdest show ever. It was awesome. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I think the whole family enjoyed that new lock and key as well. That was a lot of fun. Um, you know, a lot of the ones that, so now you want me to name shows I didn't like? Yeah, oh, you said you started something you jettisoned. Name two. Oh, okay. Um, well, let's see. Um, there's been so many. Um, didn't make it very far into Blind Spot. Didn't make it very far into Scandal. I was one like, oh, what's this? Check it out. Yes, I don't know. It just wasn't my thing. Very cool. Very cool. My uh, my, my family, we, we started to watch the Lost in Space uh, oh, reboot yeah, from, from, yeah, that Netflix has, has done. And we're, we're only, I think, maybe about four or five episodes in. But I, I, I got to give credit to where credit is due is that the actress that plays Dr. Smith, you know, who's like the villain in the Lost in Space world, except like nobody knows she's like a horrible, awful person. She, she, like, it, when I walk away from a show and if I see that actress's face and I hate her, you know, she's, she's killing that role. She's done an, yeah. an amazing. Okay. So I, I could be wrong. And maybe she's looking at, but isn't that Parker Posey it, that plays that, that doctor? She's like in a lot of, uh, the, um, oh, now I'm forgetting his the Christopher Guest movies. She's yeah. hilarious. Uh, it, so, you know, waiting for Guffman, best in show. 
those movies are awesome and she is so funny in them and so it's i remember when i watched that and i think that that's lost in space is pretty underrated and pretty well done but she's uh it's a really unusual role for her from what i've seen her do everything else you know and, and, yeah, and she's she, yeah, she's, she's nailing it yeah, she's oh, nailing it. Killer. It's like, oh, it's like, oh my God, she's that. Like, I, you just want to choke her when you see her on the screen. So you know she's. I have that name wrong. Awesome I can't job. remember. I can't remember her name, but it's, I'm pretty sure it's that same actress. I could have the name wrong, but uh, yeah, it's so weird. So you know, check out that, and then check out you know, like uh, Best in Show or uh, one of those Christopher Guest movies. Um, uh, and she's hilarious. It's so funny. So what range? Yeah, definitely. And I'm going to check out the OA, too. I love weird, wacky shows, so I'll, I'll try to put that one on my list. It's so uh, unexpected, you have no idea. <laughs> Rich, question five to you. Uh, yeah, well, I was, I was teed up to ask a, a Phoenix Suns question, so uh, you, you can't have Charles Barkley, uh, all-time great Phoenix Suns player. Okay. Um, ooh, that's tough. Um, you know, I have a lot of favorites, you know, and, and, but, you know, I'm not maybe old enough and I haven't maybe lived in Arizona long enough because I moved here when I was 21 um, to know some of the long-term history, but I just love a really good guard that makes it happen. And so, you know, it was, there's KJ back in the day, but I think Steve Nash is the guy who I've always enjoyed. And he, of course he was big on the Mavericks and other place too, but, you know, his time of the Suns was pretty great, and he was pretty killer. Yeah, that's, no, that's a great choice. Steve Nash. I like Very it. Very good. All right. Well, Carl, thank you so much. I could throw in a little one for Stoudemire there, maybe. You know, <laughs> maybe some Jason Kidd, some great, great players. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great choices. Well, thank you so much for playing five questions. Hopefully we ever have you back. We'll, uh, we'll see if we can tack on another five and see, uh, see where the conversation leads. So we're gonna move on uh, and wrap up the show with some, uh, some of our regular features. We got a museum pick and a tech pick. So I will go ahead and start with a museum pick. And uh, this was kind of a, uh, a last minute reach into the bin, but I, I'm kind of glad we got that. We, we're, we're doing this one. I hope I, hopefully I haven't done it before. I don't remember doing it before. So my museum pick is the ancient computer microphone. <laughs> Carl, you, you ever seen these before? This is like, <laughs> uh, you know, 1997. Most desktop PCs got packaged with something like this, these cheap, horrible oh, microphones. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember That's those? That's a classic. Oh, man. I was going to I was gonna start recording music. We're going to make this happen. That thing's going to go, you know. And, and, and the best part about that museum pick, I don't know if everybody can see, is the way that crazy old stupid, you know, quarter-inch cable is just wrapped in weirdly because that's how they all are those cables were so bad and, and they were such cheap little things they're such a waste of time they, they were and usually the audio like if, it, if you were just unless you're like the perfect distance from it it was either too quiet or if you're right on top of it it was like garbledy oh and you couldn't hear anything and staticky yeah but they all came with these and usually you just chucked them aside but actually, <laughs> back in the day though a microphone wasn't really a very important thing for most for most people in the desktop era. No. that's why they didn't invest in them but, <laughs> but fundamentally it, what was its purpose right <laughs> i'm gonna uh, watch, to, record record seven minutes of notes and fill up my uh, of voice notes and fill up my hard drive is that what we're gonna do here you know <laughs> right and then gaming back then usually didn't have a voice component so uh, if you play if, if you remember playing like warcraft oh, yeah. 2 over over uh, over a LAN or whatever. Um, although it wasn't LAN, it was serial cables that well, Warcraft 2 was usually played Yeah, over. that's old school right there, man. Old school stuff. Yeah, so you didn't really use the microphone much. It was a token gesture. But these days, especially in the world of the coronavirus, well, uh, audio in, in, in a computer is very important. So if you're using a laptop, it might have a built-in microphone, but those are usually just about as good as these things in most cases, and usually not very good. Or if you have a desktop, you may not have a microphone at all because they stopped packaging with them. Uh, with right. desktops years and years and years ago. So I think it might be important to, to talk about if you're doing a lot of video calls, video conferencing, you want your voice to sound good. You want people to be able to hear you. It's important. You want to come through loud and clear. So that was then, and this is now. My tech pick is going to be a really good desktop microphone that uh, you can invest in that will give you good sound, sound nice, not take up a ton of space, uh, and even look cool doing it. So I, I could have cheated and I could have used the one that I'm using here, which I, which I do love. This is the Yeti uh, from Blue Designs. But um, I, up pro pick. 
Yeah, it, yeah. This one, but this is a hundred dollar, you know, plus microphone. A little, a little more than what a lot of people need. Okay, so I, I decided. I just can't flash my wealth around like that, like you are. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's also my window blocker too. Like uh, some people have asked me, like, why do you have that, that gigantic microphone on the screen? Well, since I have this window behind me, and oh. I, I need it to like to block some of the yeah, light, so that way. Of course. It, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, eventually, I'm going to put some roll down shades here, or try to move my my uh, recording area to somewhere else where I won't have this window behind me. But at the moment, this yeah, is I always cool. solve my window problems with microphones too. It makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It, it, it does work. All right. So anyway, so my, uh, my tech pick is um, I, I decided to still look at blue. I really have enjoyed their, their products and I think they work uh, really well. And so I have picked the, what, what's called the blue snowball Whoops, that's the wrong one. It was supposed to be the Snowball Ice is what I was, yep, that's the one I was gonna pick right there. Um, <clears throat> so so the, the Blue Snowball Ice, it's kind of a big round microphone, has a, a, a little tripod so it can sit on your desk. It's round, it's not super huge, it's not as big as my gigantic one here, but for $50, so it's, you know, Look, you're not- You've had enough, all right? Just calm down, all right? You don't need to flaunt so much. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to flaunt so much, no. Uh, but you want, you want to have good sound and, um, Something like this on your desk will, will definitely make your, your voice in audio calls and um, conference calls much clearer, much easier to understand. It's very simple to use, it's plug and play, uh, and it'll give you, give you what you want. It's Skype Discord certified, will work with Microsoft Teams, will work with Zoom, works with all those, uh, all those programs. And um, yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's not overly expensive. It's not, it's not you know, a $13 upgrade. You're, 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 investing, you're investing in sounding good. And with that, you're you're ready to rock and roll. So that is my hey, good mic's a good call. Good call. That is, yeah, and that's my tech pick to go along with that. Rich, you now you have a good microphone. I do. <clears throat> so uh, Rich uh, actually has the same the same one I do. Just he doesn't use his to block a window <laughs> on his screen there. I'm tastefully discreet. I have my expensive microphone <laughs> off camera. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I'm not tastefully discreet, I guess. Um, but uh, now, Carl, what, what do you what do you use for a microphone? What do you sport in there? Oh, well, you know, you you caught me. I'm just talking into my uh, high end webcam. That's the only microphone I got on this particular setup where I am. Now, uh, at other areas, I've got some pretty nice ones. I have a Yeti as well. I have a Rode as well. Um, but I I do agree with your tech picks. Those I've heard a lot of great things about their products as well. And so I, I think you can do pretty well if you just upgrade a little bit, you know. Especially yeah, it, like, you know, some of these newer USB ones really, they do a great job. Yeah, if you get a nice webcam, some of the webcams do have good mics built in and then you're good to go. But a lot of the laptops that people use, they, they yeah, have like an okay webcam, but usually a really cheap microphone. So like something like this would be a good upgrade um, for, for those as well. But uh, yeah, never, never discount a good microphone. That's what I always like to say. It reminds me of one of the things that I am now grateful for from coronavirus is now people know how when they open a web conferencing or a Zoom to actually change their camera and their mic audio settings. They used to never be able to get there inside of an hour. Now they can do it in 15 minutes of us wandering and going, can you hear me? You know, it's way less time to get there than it used to be. <laughs> the, world, the world can learn one setting a screen at a time. Amazing. And we didn't even, and you know, and for that, we didn't even need a marmoset. <laughs> go figure. All right. So uh, Rich, Rich, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us what we might've missed in the, in the past week here. And if you were to close your eyes and look ahead into the future and read the tea leaves, what might happen? Well, you know, if, if you want to know what you may have missed, a great thing to do is visit channelpronetwork.com on Friday. Every Friday, in fact, we have our In Case You Missed It post written by our own James Gaskin, where he rounds up news from the week that was. This week, he's uh, going to have some details for you on those new V Pro processors uh, that Intel uh, just rolled out. Um, we didn't even talk about it on the show, but earlier this week, it was uh, World Anti-Ransomware Day. and We've got some uh, interesting ransomware statistics that were... Uh, uh, announced in conjunction with that. And then uh, also James has a little bit on uh, on some objective proof of something that we already knew, which is basically that uh, when people go into lockdown, they stop wearing pants and are just in PJs all day long. But this has actually uh, been measured at this point. 
looking ahead to next week, you know, obviously the, the conference scene is sort of shut down, but um, Microsoft is actually hosting its build conference, their big developer conference next week. So not in person, it's all going to be online, but I imagine there's going to be some uh, news out of Microsoft next week. Uh, and then I hinted at this uh, earlier on the show, but you know, the, uh, the hardware announcements from Dell this week were all in the consumer realm. They've got some co uh, commercial products some business products coming up next week. And uh, we will have all the details for you at uh, channelpronetwork.com. Cannot wait for that. Looking forward to it. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you. Carl, thank you. Wait, hold on so a second. What was that? Channel Pro what? Uh, ch uh, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, channelpronetwork.com is the website, Carl. Channelpronetwork.com. I'll say it three That's times. Right. resource I am proud to be associated with. And we're, we're, we're glad that you are. And we were uh, very, very glad that you could join us here and be our guest host with us today. I hope you had a good time and a lot of fun. Uh, for those who want to connect with you um, outside of the podcast space and might want to email you, might want to visit a website, uh, where can people go to learn more about you? Sure. Well, our company's website, snaptechit.com. That might be not exciting to you. I don't know. Uh, but you're welcome to email me, K Bickmore, K-B-I-C-K-M-O-R-E at snaptechit.com. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter and things like that. So just Carl Bickmore, look, look me up. Uh, I love to get connect, connections there and happy to, happy to have some exchanges and see what everybody's up to. Awesome. And I hope, uh, hope everybody does. And thanks again for, uh, for being here with us today. Uh, Channelpornetwork.com is the website. That's the third time I said it. it should stick in your memory now. Ma make it your homepage. Bookmark it. Go there each and every day. We've got news, articles, white papers, downloads, resources, podcasts, video casts. You name it. All day, every day. New content for you to uh, uh, to enjoy and help you learn and help you grow your business and help uh, do things uh, better. So make sure you do that. Uh, and please also subscribe to Channel Pro Weekly. Uh, if you if you're we're on uh, Google Podcasts, we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher, wherever you are. Make sure you hit that that. Uh, the subscribe button so you can take us with it with you wherever you go and you know, get new episodes as they come out if you are watching on youtube thanks for being here and joining us today uh please hit that red subscribe button and hit that notification bell so you know when we get new episodes on youtube as well uh uh blah, 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 blah. that's what i was supposed to say there rich i was uh having a weird aneurysm i don't know what just happened there but if you're on facebook we're channel 4 network on facebook we're at channel 4 smb on twitter if you want to follow me i'm at matt whitlock rich you are at Rich Free. So make sure you find us there. We're on LinkedIn too. So know wherever you are, we're there with you. And, uh, and we would love to connect with you. So that is going to do it for episode 145. Thank you all for being here. Thanks again to Carl Bickmore, Bickmore and Jason Bryce, Bryce Stack. And uh, we will, by Strack. I knew it. I, I knew I was going to mess it up again, Rich. I did it. I told myself I was going to do it. Thanks to Jason by Strack for being with us. And we will see you all in episode 146 next week. Thank you.